Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. This is a very special podcast for me because I get a chance to spend an hour with a dear friend and somebody I I really look up to. Jerry DeWitt was a pastor in Louisiana. He was, as I understand it, and I'll ask him about this, a true blue Sunday go to meet and Pentecostal pastor, the, the real deal. And uh, he ain't anymore. (laughs) Them days is over. And his story has been featured all across the country. He's been on the uh, he's been in the New York Times. He's been featured in USA Today, CNN. He is the author of a new book called Hope After Faith, an ex-pastor's journey from belief to atheism. And he is my guest tonight. Jerry DeWitt, glad to have you, my friend. It is always a pleasure, my friend. I love you dearly. Thank you for having me. You don't really stop these days. I see you everywhere. You're on this TV network. You're on that network. You're on Morning Joe. You're being interviewed here. You're, and I'm sure it's a great problem to have, but you must be just fried. I am exhausted, and what contributes to that is that I'm so stinking lazy. <laughs> Whatever. I hate, I hate working. I hate activity. I love sitting and watching TV, and so uh, I'm not accustomed to this to this amount of work. I, I don't believe you. Anybody who's been a pastor knows that it's work. You know, P- yes. you were dealing with people all the time, solving problems. You're part counselor. You're you know you're part policeman. Right. You're part. Yeah, that's right. You know, um, <laughs> MP. You're always on guard. That's right. I've been trying to make sure that everybody sort of gets the word about the book. I I think they should read it for two reasons. One is I think it's a fascinating story. And the the second thing is I just want you to be supported out there. I I love the idea of, you know, because I know I know what you've been through. You've you've lost a lot. And I'm not trying to get you to play the victim card here, but I mean you have lost a lot coming out as a non-believer coming through the clergy project and were you the first official graduate of the clergy project is that right that that's that's correct and we're we're trying um particularly the board is interested in trying to um you know modify the language a little bit because some of our some of our critics take that terminology first graduate and say ah see there you know dawkins has created this program to deconvert people or to uh, steal ministers away from the faith while they're doubting and and so you know as probably all of your devoted listeners know the clergy project doesn't have a program you have to already have acknowledged within yourself and be able to acknowledge it to us that you are agnostic or atheist before you can even enter the program. So um, as much as I love the title that I'm, I'm the first graduate, at the same time, there was no program to graduate from. It was something that Dan Barker said kind of tongue-in-cheek, and you know, we all ran with it because it's so stinking clever. So is the are they saying that it's more predatory, like they're seeking out pastors and attempting yes. to sort of indoctrinate them out of religion? Right. Is that what the charge is? Yeah, that's what the charge is. And, you know, poor poor Richard Dawkins, um, and that's probably not something people say very often, you know, poor Richard Dawkins, but but he, he really does take a lot of heat. And, um, you know, every time he posts anything about what I'm doing, just like, you know, last weekend on CNN. Uh, he, he didn't even create the title for the article or for the video. He literally copied it straight off of CNN's page. And, you know, it had this, this you know, horrible uh, misunderstanding of this thing called Atheist Church. And, you know, people just got on his site and beat the stuffings out of him. And so we're trying to make sure we're at least you can't fix things in other people's minds, but we're trying to at least present ourselves as clearly as possible. 
We're going to come back to the atheist church thing a little later on in the interview. Folks, that's called a tease, by the way. We do it a lot in radio. Um, take me back. You're going to the Jimmy Swaggart. Uh, was it one of those he comes through town kind of a Billy Graham-ish convention thing that you went to or what? What's the story? So the deal is, it actually was his church, Family Worship Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, you know, this is in the mid and you know to late eighties, and so the mega church movement was was really starting to get underway. And obviously, he was at the front of that, especially due to the power of his uh, telecast. So I I was asked by my fourth grade teacher. I was 16, and I wasn't still in the fourth grade. I just still had a relationship with her, which I probably should have been. Would have been better off if I was still in the fourth grade. But uh, she asked me, you know, she was Assembly of God, and uh, Swaggart was, uh, you know, at the forefront of the Assembly of God denomination at the time. And she asked me to attend a youth camp meeting. Uh, and so, so off I went with her and her husband and her youth group. And it was, um, it was literally everything that I didn't know I was looking for. It really was. It was, it was, it was fantastic. Now, is this before he went through all the stuff with the prostitutes and yes. the scandals? This was, he still had a relatively clean slate at this point particular point in his career, yes? Absolutely, yes. I mean, he was Christianity's knight in shining armor. He was uh, he was who everyone wanted to be. He he literally was uh, creating the template, and, and through the sheer um, beauty and power of his personality was creating an industry, very much at the height. I have a hard time. I'm, forgive the cynicism in me, Jerry, <laughs> but the word beauty and associated with Jim. I mean, when I look at the guy, I just think slimy. I, I think shyster. And I, look, I know you love people and you're, yeah. you don't often go there, but yeah. I look at him and I think this is a guy who's, and he's still cashing in. Uh, I, I have a very difficult time. How many hookers does he have to be caught with before, yeah. you know, his credibility goes absolutely th through the basement and yet people yeah. continue to attend? I don't know. I can't explain it. Do you have a theory? Um, I, I don't know if I have a, a clean theory. I have more of a feeling about it. You know, there it, it's it is it is bizarre that we are able to create relationships with caricatures. You know, obviously, very few people within his congregation or even in the greater expanse of his following actually have a relationship with him personally. They're not sitting down and having dinner with him every night. But yet, as human beings, it's easy to develop a you know, some type of virtual relationship, at least with this character that you call Jimmy Swaggart. And you do wish them the best. And whenever you have such an emotional attachment, you know, your credibility becomes tied into their credibility. If you're a church member going there and you have been inviting people for 20, 30, 40 years to come and, and hear your minister participate in your church, Obviously, because we saw so many people uh, leave, you know, leave his church and and leave his following. Not everyone falls into this trap, but some people, I think, some very well-intended people, they fall into the trap that um, to leave him would be to leave everything they've said and stood for, whenever things were doing better. And so it's just. It's incredibly complicated. It, it really is. It's Did you see some of the sort of cult of personality whenever you were a pastor? It happens a lot with public figures. Did sure. Did you fight against that? You know, I'm on the podium. I'm a counselor. I'm an encourager. I'm a cheerleader. People yes. rely on me. You probably always had to keep yourself kind of in check on that, huh? I, I did. I fought against it when I was pastoring. Um, I I did not fight against it whenever I was evangelizing because I wasn't mature enough yet. I, I, I enjoyed it. I don't think that I ever intentionally manipulated it or took advantage of it. I, I probably wasn't even completely cognizant of it 
but yet there was still a part of me that looking back now, I know that I was enjoying it. You know, I, I joke all the time about being five foot five, you know, and, and overweight and, uh, you know, barely making it out of high school. So to actually find a, um, a platform, an arena to, to work in, to be creative in, to be self-expressive in, and at the same time to, to fulfill to some degree your humanistic uh, values and desires to help people, for all of that to mesh in just the right way that people love and adore you, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty friggin' addicting. I think people, though, there's some people who are wired to go out and blaze a trail and uh I mean, I, I come from radio. I'm guilty. We we weren't satisfied to simply have our voices heard face to face. We felt the need to go out with a bullhorn. You sure. know, I said in my book, I'm like, are people in that industry, are they insecure, egotistical, or insane? And I always just say, yeah. yes. You yes. Know, <laughs> yes. 100%. <laughs> right. That's right. That's exactly right. My, my um, you know, my, my old pastor... Um, we call him senior pastor. He's in the book, uh, George Glass Jr. He he readily admits that uh, the fact that the preacher lives for next Sunday so that he can stand in front of, you know, several hundred people and all make them clap in his direction is, uh, you know, it's it's evidence that he's probably the weakest person in the room. It's probably a little bit of a temperature change in the skeptical community. And now, granted, these people, the, like the thinking atheist community is a great example. These people have my back. They are my family. They are my support group. They are the people that I, you know, I, can, I know I can rely on. But at the same time, it's not like blind allegiance. It's right. if you blow it, if you make a mistake, if you start to veer off the trail and and it does become something sort of perverse, <laughs> you know, sure. they'll, they'll be the first ones to raise the hand. I mean, it's a little bit of a different animal on the other side of the religion question. Or has it been for you? Yes, m- most definitely. And, and I find it refreshing. I, I, find, um, I find knowing that the majority of the people that are sitting in the audience when you're speaking or, in my case, you know, preaching, that that every single one of them, no matter how much they love you, no matter how much they you know respect you, they will absolutely call you down if you say or do something stupid. I I I honestly find it refreshing because in the religious world, yes, there's a great benefit to knowing that that you can be the cult leader in the midst of a cult of personality, but you also, if you have any heart whatsoever, also what comes with that is the weight of the world. Because all of these people who you may enjoy them following you blindly, they're still blind, and you're the only person who's trying to keep the whole car out of the ditch. And so I, I like that the weight of the world isn't dependent upon me. And I'll be honest, I, I tread very lightly. There are a lot of very important subjects, not just uh, in our culture and in our world, but in our movement, that I don't say a stinking thing about. I avoid uh, as, as much as I can avoid it because I, I know that if I say something stupid, I'm going to be called on it. And, and I'm, not gonna, I'm not just going to you know, be as flippant as I might have been, especially in my evangelistical days. You play to your strengths, you contract out your weaknesses. I cheat on the radio. I just have special <laughs> guests on who are smarter and better than me. Welcome to the show, Jerry DeWitt. <laughs> oh, if that were true. So oh. talk to me about, well, I mean, I'm, you don't have to spill the beans. I know uh, yeah. you want people to be able to sort of get the depth of the story. But for you, how in the world did you get from a true blue behind the podium? I mean, were you one of those guys who was... Uh, Walking around, pacing left and right, shouting, carrying on. Was that sure. you, Jerry? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, all you got to do is Google me and you'll see I'm still doing it, you know, <laughs> in other places. Uh, but I, but I, as, I, as I told a reporter just this weekend, you know, I apologized to him because I was so tired. I was so tired. And I felt like that I just totally flopped, you know, in my presentation. And I sat back down next to the reporter after I got through. And he was like, oh, good job. That was very inspiring. I'm like, oh, that was total crap. I'm so tired. And he's like, really? And I was like, yeah, there, there wasn't any preaching to that. And he said, 
well, on a scale of you know zero to a hundred, what what? How would you compare that to the days whenever you you know used to preach in church? And I would say maybe a twenty five. Wow. You know, and his jaw drops. And and honestly, I think if you Google anything I've done in the secular movement, um, I might maybe from time to time may have peaked at a forty. But no, I I preached one hundred percent back and forth across the pulpit. Yeah, you were all in, right? Was, You're all, all in. It's a highly emotional experience. Experience. Yes, you are. You're part of what feels like kind of a pep rally for God. People are standing yes. to their feet. People are are, are so, crying and praying and hugging and dancing and, and going crazy. Yes. And, and how do you go from that level of conviction to hi, I'm Jerry DeWitt, yeah. atheist? How does this happen? This is this is where this is where my brother. I can't help but sound egotistical. Okay. And how it happens is I took it seriously. I took it all extremely seriously. I took what we were preaching seriously. I took the doctrine seriously. I took our mission to meet human needs, to lessen human suffering, to be exactly right, to uh, follow the apostles' doctrine more closely than anyone, to bring God into reality, uh, to touch the feet of Jesus. I took it all seriously, so seriously that I suffered, my family suffered. Uh, we paid the highest price that that we were asked to pay because— we took it so seriously, and and I think that's what made the difference. And and I know that many believers, you know, listen to your show, and they're going to say, "Well, he's being insulting. He's saying that since I still believe, I I must not be taking it seriously." And I I can't answer that because I don't know anyone else's mind or heart. But I know that's what did it for us. You we said, just, "I'm going to vet this information in the Bible, or I'm yes. going to pray for a miracle." I yes. mean. How are you all, testing uh, the waters? Yeah, so I was testing the waters in all those ways. It was, we, you know, I, I come from this little this little faction within Pentecostalism where we're even better than Pentecostals because we call ourselves apostolic. And in the South, you know, we, we go a step further and we abbreviate it and call ourselves apostolic. And, and, <laughs> and, and what, we, what we meant by that was, was that we, we believed that we were following the teaching of the New Testament apostles more closely than anyone else within Christianity. And so what immediately occurred to my mind was, if that is true, then we should be seeing the same um, miracles, we should be seeing the same close encounters with God that the early church claims to have seen in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And, um, and so whenever we weren't seeing those things, my idea was, well, maybe we're not following the doctrine as closely as we should or could. And so I began to investigate the doctrine. And I, I was always on the path of trying to find truth, trying to bring God into my real life, not something abstract that was just simply always only being taken by faith and to uh, lessen human suffering and to, uh, to, to, to bring about a worldwide revival. That's what happens when you start vetting the information that you used to just cherish, right? Yes, absolutely. We, we believed, but we didn't really know. And once we decided to know, that's when the dominoes started to fall, huh? Yes, that's what I like to say is, is that once you challenge your traditions, your superstitions are soon to follow. Because you don't, you don't realize necessarily in the beginning that your superstitions are actually resting upon the tabletop of your traditions. And once you start pulling those legs of that tabletop out from under the traditions that you were brought up in or that you were given, soon uh, the superstitions that rest upon it are going to begin to tumble as well. And obviously that's what happened, but it took 25 years because I fought it all the way. I was not looking for it. I did not want it. I was not enjoying it. Um, there was one small part of my psyche that, that enjoyed discovering something new about theology, and sometimes that meant by discovering that what I had believed previously was wrong. 
there was a part of me that enjoyed that, but I did not enjoy the isolation. I did not enjoy that it caused me to have to move from one church to another, from one group of fellowship, you know, one fellowship to another fellowship. I have found the entire process miserable. I really have. Well, let's go back in time. Let's say you see this train coming. Would you yes. still have done it? Would you still take the leap? Or is ignorance bliss? You know, a lot of people say, geez, sometimes I wish I'd never opened my big mouth. You know? you know, that's such a beautiful question, my friend. I remember in Des Moines, Iowa, of course, I, 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 I detail it you know, uh, immensely within the book. Des Moines, Iowa was a huge turning point. Uh, because, you know, the part of the country it's in, they had this huge elaborate basement underneath the church, and it was their it was their printing house. It's where they were printing uh, the books that the pastor had written and the sermons that he had preached. They were printing them, I don't even remember, in how many different languages. And I I got a tour late one night. I mean, Seth, like, like 2 o'clock in the morning, somebody gave me a tour through there, and there was like 10 people sitting in this in this little church on owned printing house, and they were just working feverishly, putting this guy's thoughts into other languages to send across the world. And there didn't seem to be a question or even a trouble among them. And I remember even then walking through there saying, man, ignorance is bliss. Yeah. You know, I really, you know, because I was having troubles and I was already having troubles with his doctrine and his way of doing things. And I remember thinking at that moment, for sure, if somebody would have, you know, would have given me a choice between two different colored pills, I definitely would have took the one that would have kept me in the matrix. I can <laughs> tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm that talking here with uh, with Jerry DeWitt. Let's talk about another th For those listening, if it sounds like I have a real affection for, for Jerry and the way he does things, uh, we have a lot in common. I'm not a pastor. I never was. But, but one thing that you and I share, which is sometimes a controversial thing in the free thought movement, is a lot of times when you're dealing with the truth, you're dealing with facts. You're dealing with the mind. Yes. What I like to bring to the conversation so often that we miss is to also include the heart. Yes. And many people are very, very nervous about touching people on an emotional level, reaching for the heartstrings to, to create more of an immersive experience because they fear that we're simply being religious about our, our non-belief. Yes. I just uh, produced a video that uses emotive music and it's got, you know, professional this and it's got all these different sort of carefully packed. The message is sound and, and I used storytelling tools to augment what I felt was a strong message to sort of take it to another level beyond the mind and also to the heart. And yes. and there's a real skittishness out there about touching people emotionally, grabbing them by the heartstrings occasionally and and. And I know you're a you're a lover, right? You're a hug Absolutely. person. You're a wrap your arms around other people, and and you're an enthusiasm person. You're a joy person. You're a sad. Right. You just you sort of suck the marrow out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I try. I try. And people probably come after you for that, right? Come on, this guy's pretty much preaching from the stage. He's just preaching atheism. Is right. Do you want to speak to that at all, Jerry? Sure. I, I need I, you to have my back. Is what I'm looking. <laughs> I have a selfish reason for asking the question. <laughs> Absolutely. No. I'm. You, and you know, you know that I've got your back. It, it was. It was. Uh, you know. And and this is going to sound like I'm doing nothing but you know a commercial for you, but I think even if I was, that would be fair. You know, it, it was your program that that really touched and sparked a part of me during um, you know during this transition that I had not felt otherwise. There was a depth. There was there was this touching of the heart, all while being completely and totally supported by truth by reason by evidence and so i i i was a little taken by surprise that this was an issue you know i guess maybe i guess maybe i was naive enough new enough in in the movement that that i thought the way that you talk and the way that you communicate your message was just the way that we were going to do it you know that that was that that was the way to do it. There was no doubt in my mind that you were doing it more professionally than anyone else because you had the skill, you had the abilities, you had you know you have the know-how. But at the same time, I I really 
I was I was naive enough to not even realize this was going to be a thing. And obviously, it, it has turned out to be a thing. This is very controversial. And and I'm sorry that it is. I, I wish that it wasn't. I wish that I, you know, could get in the TARDIS and go back and, you know, fix, change whatever road we needed to change in order to, for this not to be an issue. But, but it is. And well, maybe, what are the kinds of things you hear, Jerry? Is it style? Is it the fact that you are, that, you know, people will come out of, let's say, a, a Victor Stinger lecture and they've learned a lot. I mean, it's been a yes. very content rich thing. They come out of a Jerry DeWitt Sunday morning atheist evangelism, whatever service they tag they put on it to make it fun or funny. Sure. And they come out and they say, man, I was really touched by that. And so it's right. a different response. It is. What are the kind of things you're hearing from Well I, I think to summarize the criticism, it's it's that I'm attempting to manipulate people. And that I am taking, not just me, but you know, people like me, are, are, are taking people back towards religion, thus making them vulnerable again to manipulation. That, that emotion is purely for the sake of manipulation. And I, I, I truly, I get it. I understand. I know exactly where they're coming from. Um, unfortunately, I can't change, um, you know, human biology. I can't change how we're made up. I can't change the fact that we are not disembodied, um, you know, um, intellects floating around on the iCloud. You know, I mean, I can't, I can't change the fact. So whenever needs are, are expressed, then it's my heart, my pastor's heart, quote unquote, to try to meet those needs. That's who I've always been. That's who I will always be. So it's really just about, you know, they don't know if they can trust me. And I understand that. I think it probably draws in some people, though, who might have checked out of the conversation because they thought, well, all they're doing is sitting around being cerebral. They don't understand the challenges that I have going through. They don't know what it's like with a mother and father who are heartbroken. They don't know what it's like to be insulted and pitied by my religious community, to be ostracized by my church. They don't understand the baggage that comes. They're just throwing facts at me. And I think that's where somebody like you come in handy because you can go in having gone through some significant personal sacrifices yourself and you can wrap your arms around them and just say, I get you. I totally get you. Yeah, that that that's exactly right. And obviously that's what you do as well. I mean, that's that speaks volumes towards the popularity of of your communication style. People want to know that they are got, that people get them, that people understand them. And so we're at this weird place in the movement right now that we're not having to create new needs. We're not having to manipulate people into wanting something. The need has always been there. There are people who are not lifelong atheists. There are people who have um, more of a for lack of better words, church family type personality, that that's what they enjoy, that's how they find meaning in their lives, uh, versus there's a lot of other people in the movement that they have a completely different personality, and that and that's obviously okay and, and is equally supported. But for those other people who have this need that I, I kind of refer to as a nostalgic need, they come out of religion— and and I think that's one of our downfalls is our use of language. They've come out uh, out from under superstition, but yet they still want to feel that communal activity that they grew up in and were accustomed to. And and so the need's always been there, and they have a right to have those needs met. Talking here with Jerry DeWitt, the author of the new book Hope After Faith. How hard was it to write the book? Was it crazy? Were you up it all night? Was. Where did you get writer's block? Were you it you was, know, listening to your favorite songs on the radio. How, how did you do it? How was the process? It was incredibly, it was incredibly hard. And, um, and what really made it hard was we had such a short deadline. We really, we really had the majority of the first draft together in four months. And so that was just, that was pushing it. That was every day. We knew that we had to have a thousand words every day 
you know that we that we could submit to the publisher and and obviously what what made the whole thing possible and come about was my co-writer Ethan Brown is just absolutely totally fabulous and um and if and if I've ever been given a a gift in my life uh in the form of relationship and support it it's definitely been Ethan Brown he he's amazing absolutely phenomenal are you online only or are you in, I already know the answer. This is like a leading question, but, or are you in stores, Jerry, do it <laughs> because I, I look, I, I see your Facebook post of you inside Barnes and Noble and buying a copy of your own book. And I just, yeah. I'm smiling like an idiot. Like I'm so happy. I'm like, look, it's Jerry. He's, he's at Barnes and Noble. How awesome was that day? Well, huh? well it, it is, it is a fantastic day. Um, you know, even the documentary film crew, uh, I will say fortunate for them because, you know, it, it added a little extra layer of stress to the moment. But there's one particular bookstore in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that I've I've always been uh, extra, extra fond of. And I don't know exactly why. Somehow in my travels, this just became, um, you know, a, a place of serenity for me. And so that was the first place that I saw my book on the bookshelf. And, and you know, know, obviously, I'm going to always uh, expose my bromance with you by saying <laughs> it, it, it makes me feel even that much better to see my book close to your books. So, Whatever. You know, your book's on the shelf there as well. The book is, is what? Autobiography? Is it a book with religious arguments that challenge your former faith? It's, it's straight up memoir. You know, it's it's straight up memoir, and it's really not until the very very end of the book that um, you know that we go into a dialogue that expresses uh, secular values and and really how how a non believer does possess hope after they have left their faith or graduated from their faith. But but by and large, it is truly a memoir. You. You'll know so much about me, and in in and in knowing about me, you'll then know what it's like to live the life of a fundy, and what it's like, in particular, to live the life of a, of a minister. And so, I I hope that's what everyone really takes away from it is that, you know, I can't help it. I I just cannot help myself. You know, I support. Um, you know the foundation beyond belief. I support be secular. I I I support all these beautiful organizations, and I do my best to to give a shout out to them and to do the things that I can do. But for me, I'm always going to somehow somehow expose how much love and compassion and empathy I have for the members of the clergy project, and I, and that's my wish is that this book causes the movement and the world to have empathy for the members of the clergy project. Many people are pretty uncharitable to believers. Yes. Um, I, you, maybe it's a defense mechanism where you and I are like, well, many of them are just stellar people, probably because we... We were there up to our yes. eyeballs in the culture. Maybe we're defending our own reputations. Look, I know I was pretty thick to take 30 years to crawl out, but I right. made it. Right. But the truth is, is that where people are busy lobbing those verbal grenades over the fence, quite often those charges are unfair. They may be misled. They may be operating from poor information. They may be uh, products of a childhood of indoctrination. But a great, great many of these men, women, and youth... They're stellar people. They have huge hearts. They want to make the world a better place. They're trying to live moral lives. They're trying to raise moral children. They're trying to do all. They're trying to do it right. Yes. They don't deserve all of the mud that we we sling in their direction. And I know you can speak to that as well. Yes, I, I completely agree with that. And what I what I would say to the mudslingers towards believers who who feel as if these people are are just intentionally being ignorant and overlooking the obvious. And, and, and of course, some percentage are, because that's just you know the law of numbers. But by and large, I have to defend the believers, and I have to ask the mudslingers, do you think there's anything incredibly important in your life that you have yet to find the time to study? 
Is there anything incredibly world-changing that you could actually spend a little more time on looking into? And the answer is yes. For everyone, every one of us, we're all struggling to to pay our bills, to make our way, to secure our relationships, to you know, to love our family members. We're all spending our days living out the human experience, and few of us ever find all the time that we need to address all the important issues of life. There are things that even the best of us, the freer, you know, the freest of the free thinkers of us still take for granted. And that's what enables me to defend the believers and to not throw mud any more than what I do just because sometimes I'm a shallow and, you know, and, 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 <laughs> well, and, and you know, a person, you know. <laughs> when I was a believer, we had complete misconceptions about non-believers. You know, when you yes. said the word atheist, it conjured up the character and you began to think, well, they are this and they are that. And, right. and those descriptions were not kind. Right. And only when we began to see each other in three dimensions did we realize, wait a minute, these are... These are multi-dimensional people. These are people with some real depth, many of them with real depth to them. And you'll find the worst of the worst in any culture. Sure. You'll find them in the atheist and the, cre and the creationist or believing circles as well, right? Right. All, all it takes is Facebook. Just, you know, just cruise Facebook and you'll find the worst of us yeah. on all sides. That, that, that's exactly right. I, I'm, I'm convinced <laughs> that, that life is truly complicated. And the believer who sits in church for two hours out of the week um, is getting some type of benefit from that, obviously. And for all the other hours of the week, they're just trying to live life. They're they're just trying to you know to get by. And I, I honestly, I I, I wish that I could take credit for everything. But I don't take credit for being where I'm at. I feel like that, yes, my personality plays a role in this. My sincerity plays a role in this. But also, life brought me experiences that many people who are still comfortably sitting in the pew have not experienced. And so I don't take credit for those experiences. I am very thankful that those experiences came my way and caused me to look the directions I looked. But I know if they didn't happen, I could very easily still be one of those people who's sitting in the pew. It's so, funny, if I hadn't watched a specific Christopher Hitchens debate video yes. on a certain day, I might not be talking to you right now. It's like the butterfly that's effect. That's it, right. You know, it's amazing. That's 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 exactly right and 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 you know when i started pastoring as relating back to the beginning of our conversation as an evangelist yes i was very much enjoying this cult of personality that can very quickly develop around you in a religious environment but as a pastor i was so cognizant of my weaknesses my imperfections um my own temptations I felt like I could more effectively minister to people in the congregation by not just it's you know not getting down on their level but admitting that I was on their level there was there was no higher level for me to come down from that we were all you know we were all walking our way through this life together and so that's still very much how I feel and how I look at things so the angry atheist I get them the mudslinging atheist. I get them. Let me tell you, just last night, somebody made a Facebook post, tagged my name in it. It's someone that I shared um, the, a ministerial alliance position with whenever I was pastoring into Quincy, Louisiana. And I, there's a part of me that knows that they have the best intentions, but yet it still pissed me off <laughs> to no end. I mean, it made me fighting mad. And I rewrote my response 15 times, you know, each time getting friendly, you know, getting more and more friendly each, each time. But that first response yeah. was snarky and petty and, you know, defensive. So I, I get the mudslinger and I get the angry atheist, but at the same time, this, this thing is complicated and we have got to find, we've got to find more ways to work together. I don't feel like, I don't feel like when I realized I was an atheist that all of a sudden I woke up on the other side of the fence. 
I'm, I have this crazy notion, Seth, that when I woke up from religion, I actually got above the whole subject and was now allowed. It's like this, this movement, uh, this gospel of inclusion that, uh, you know, that, that uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson, you know, uh, founded. It's like suddenly my inclusiveness expanded to the point of being able to take in the entire world. So I, 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 I just, I remember, I, just love it. I remember Carl, Pastor Carlton Pearson, for those who aren't familiar with the story, was a pastor in my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma at a church called Higher Dimensions. And he was hugely charismatic. We had him on the radio several times to do some stuff. I mean, this amazingly charismatic cat, you know, and right. he came out with, um, Correct me if I get it wrong, Jerry, but it was kind of a universalist position. Like there is yes. no hell and God wants everyone to go to heaven. And yes. uh, it was a much more inclusive message of love. And there was right. a lot less judgment. And he paid a significant personal price for That's that. Right. Yes, even even though he technically stayed within, you know, very loose boundaries of Christianity. Um, he lost his church. He had what some people would consider to be a mega church. He he lost, you know, he lost uh, his finances. He lost his following. He lost everything for simply saying he no longer believed that there was a hell to go to. You know, I mean, that's that's yeah. how that's how tricky this is. And so I, I, I feel, well, you I know feel about sacrifice. I mean, I'm not trying to paint yeah. you the martyr here, but you know about loss. I mean, knowing your story there, you've been through it, my friend. Uh, yes. you know, I, I just, just assure me now you're not living in the back of a, of a VW <laughs> van anywhere, right? You're, you're doing no, all right. right? I'm, not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, in the, I'm not in my little PT cruiser, you all know, right. so it's kind of funny when the film crew was here. Um, that was, you know, obviously a part of the story that they were very interested in. And so, so, you know, they, they were like, did you ever, you know, really, cause I'd made the statement that I'd studied on how to do this, how you can live out of your car. Wow. And there's a whole little cottage industry, you know, of living out of your car. <laughs> and so they were like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And I, I just pulled it up on my laptop, you know, while they were there. And so, so I'm sure they've got this footage over my shoulder of me pulling up these websites of, you know, teaching you how to live out of your car. Now, are those so, thoughts going through your mind, Jerry? I'm, I'm in this weird position where I'm insanely curious, but I don't want to trot into any no, no, too no, no. deep personal issues. I, I want to make sure I'm respecting boundaries. But look, when you walk away from something you've been doing for so long, you're, right. you're trying to determine what's my skill set? What do I have to offer the world? What, where am I going to go? What's going to happen to my family? You're looking right at it, man. Yes. I'm still freaking out, Seth. I really am. I, I you know, I, I am positive. I, there truly is hope after faith. All of the things that people see about me and love, you know, love about what I say and what I post, all of those things are real. And at the same time, there's this other real part of me that I am absolutely teetotally on the verge of freaking out. I am, I'm about 60 days away from being just as broke as I was in 2011 when I got fired from my secular job, hmm. you know, because there's just, there, there's no income. It, 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 it staggers me. Um, that I've been in the movement now for almost two years, and there hasn't been a single organization with a paying position that has said, hey, Jerry, you know, we, we think we could use a guy like you. And now, that's not a criticism towards the organizations. That's, that's an example explaining how tricky this is for ex-ministers. And those and, who think you're cashing in with this huge uh, book royalty avalanche that's coming gosh. in, let me uh, tell you, the advance has been spent. The advance is gone. The yeah. advance is over. <laughs> that was taken up with the bankruptcy. That was taken up with trying to save the house. That's been taken up with trying to keep, you know, a two liter of Coke in the refrigerator. That has been taken up with traveling across the country speaking for groups. You know, it's um, it, it's really, really scary. So now I'm in this crazy place, okay, that we have founded you know, this, what, what we refer to as a secular service, a secular community in Lake Charles, Louisiana, which, you know, the media wants to call atheist church. Yeah. Um, but we founded that, but we've intentionally created a, a business model, a financial model where I won't receive anything from that. 
strictly to avoid the criticism that, hey, here he is. Here's this ex-preacher who's just trying to, you know, now fleece atheists. He, he got all of this money out of Christianity, and now he's trying to, you know, broaden his consumer base and, and start ripping off atheists. And so there, there literally is no income. And the future is sort of this, this sort of fuzzy, foggy thing. <laughs> like, right. Like, right. Wh- what's the next six months going to be like? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't here? know what the next six months would be like. The next two months, there'll still be, you know, a two liter of Coke in the yeah. refrigerator. But after that, I'm not sure. And here's the deal. Here, here's the hope. I've traveled the country, um, you know, for lack of a better word, spreading this message. For me personally hoping that um, somebody would say, hey, you know, I, I think you would be a great fit for this company. You know, would you mind if we, you know, paid you $2,000 a month, you know, um, or, or for an organization to say, you know, we think you'd make a good fit. I'll be, boy, my publisher will, will really, really hate <laughs> this if they hear it. But I'll be honest with you, the biggest thrill that I got about this book was I thought, Maybe someone will see me through this book and say, there's something that he might could do. You know, I thought maybe a, a speaking agency might would say, look at that guy. You know, he's not half bad with a little practice and some help. We might could make something out of him. And a speaking agency would say, you know, we can we can get you some gigs and help you pay your light bill. How about yep. somebody who just sees you as a guy of integrity? Well, look, you know what? You got to give him this. Yeah. He sticks to his principles. I think he'd, yeah. he'd certainly be an honest part of the team. Let's bring him on kind of a thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, all of that, all of that would be really good. I mean, I've, I've got programs, some of which I can't divulge yet, but I'll come back and divulge them to you first, um, that, that it's going to take whatever money I can come up with out of my own pocket to make happen. And they're going to be, I kid you not, when, you know, whenever we tell the world about, you know, one program in particular, people are going to be thrilled, but it's something that once again, comes without any financial support. So I'll be honest with you. That's, that's the criticisms that ticked me off the most. Just last night, you know, when the CNN thing started uh, being posted on, on the Dawkins site, you know, people were saying, well, he's doing that to, uh, to get rich and have sex. <laughs> and I'm like, somebody prove to me that either one of those is possible, please. Okay, well let's let's get into the church if you got a few extra minutes for sure, me, Jerry. Absolutely. I mean, are you guys doing are you doing secular hymns? Are you passing the plate? Are you behind the podium? Are you, I mean give me an inside view of what the service is like. What's going yeah. on? Well, despite what CNN said, there is no passing the plate. All right. This is this is constrictly being funded by uh, by very well meaning uh, people, you know, who just want to see something happen. So obviously there is something that uh, people who haven't attended a Pentecostal church would consider to be preaching. If you've ever been to a Pentecostal church, then you know that what I'm doing really isn't preaching. It's just supercharged lecturing, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so there is music, and and there's not necessarily secular hymns, but like for instance, you know, we enjoy we enjoy very um, life affirming. Um, Secular songs such as like you know what a wonderful world um, I see clearly now even even more modern music like we are young from fun or be strong you know strong from Kelly Clarkston to um, you know you name it anything that points back towards um, that this is the one life that we have to live and we should be giving a certain amount of our attention towards enjoying it and and doing good what do you call it what's the name of the is it i'm calling it a church well, well what, yeah, what do you call the establishment so the, yeah exactly yeah. uh well it's going to sound churchy and and we did that a little bit on purpose we call it community mission chapel and we chose chapel because that's 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 as close as you can get to saying church or temple and still be somewhat benign you know, still be a little a little ambiguous about what direction that is pushing. But we we obviously are very proud of calling it community mission because that's the mission. So here in the deep south, 
there is a nostalgic need that has always existed within the movement. We're not trying to take the movement a new direction or say this is what everybody should be doing because we don't think that way. But we do know that there's always been a nostalgic need, particularly in the Deep South, that's only coming to the surface now because the demographics are changing and the movement is growing. So obviously you're going to see needs more prevalently than you would have had you know, before. And, and that need is our culture is a church family culture. That's how we function in the Deep South. Whenever you take a new job or you make a new acquaintance or you meet your neighbor for the first time, inevitably, the first question that is asked, maybe second in some occasions, is where do you go to church? Hmm. You know, and, and that's just the reality. That's the reality of our culture. So many people who are totally, completely atheist, totally, completely agnostic, whatever term you want to use, they are nostalgic for that cultural community. But aren't you playing into the hands of the people who say, come on, this is proof that atheism is just another religion or atheism is church? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, we're, we're absolutely playing into those hands. Hmm. 100%. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and I find that regretful. But the dilemma that I'm faced with is when you have people um, who are asking for you to use your skill set, asking for you to help them meet a need, you have that on one hand, and then you have people who say, well, you know, you're, you're making this harder when people are debating other people. What am I, you know, what are we supposed to do? Not just me. You know, I keep saying, what am I supposed to do? Because I really don't want to speak for anyone else. But obviously, this is a growing phenomenon. And so, you know, am I, am I supposed to, to wait around until the lexicon within the debating industry changes in such a way that what we're doing doesn't make it more difficult for them? You know, I, I, or do you go meet that need and you try to prove that that's not necessarily the case? So playing into it, 100%. But I would, I would give you this, though. I mean, we are relational creatures. We, we crave connection. And, you know, there are a few hipsters I'll find that pop into the page and they see any attempt to organize as sheep-like behavior, right? You're not part right. of a community. You're just part of the herd. <laughs> right. Um, but I think if you got one guy throwing stones against the wall, right, let's say he's, he's doing battle, or you have an army, an organized army throwing stones, <laughs> you know, I mean, my money's on the army. Quite frankly, I think community organizing, coming together for common purpose, these things have tremendous merit, and the church does not have a monopoly on it. In fact, they should have never been given the opportunity to co-opt it away from everybody else to begin with. That is, see, that's why you are who you are and Whatever. you are where you're at. I'm not, I'm not kidding. That, that is exactly the point. To, to forego this type of com communal experience and, and methodology because religion has held it for so long is literally to cut off your nose to spite your face. And so I, I, Here's what here's what's happening in the background. I'm working with people like Matt, you know, from the atheist experience, um, because because Matt obviously loves me and 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 wants to support me in every way, but at the same time has to deal with this subject, you know, because he's he's you know one of the great debaters of our time, yeah. and so we're having this dialogue and we're trying to say, okay, what. You know, how can we work with the language? What what is it that we need to do? How can we how can we make ourselves clearer as you know, as to not create factions within the movement? And so it is something we take very, very seriously. I think though, when you're dealing with a I mean the dark side of, of a skeptical culture is that there is no absence of ego. Right. Uh, and and I'm and You'll find that anywhere, but if you yeah. find people who consider themselves on the right side of an argument, and they very well may be, quite often it also attracts those who consider themselves morally, intellectually, personally superior to others. 
Right. And and then we'll find. I mean, human beings don't need an excuse to to divide. We'll find a reason. Sure. To faction off and become our own little tribe. Yes. Um, I don't know that I I worry a whole lot about those unless it's epidemic, unless it's I, just you know, if it's the exception and not the rule, I tend to keep moving eyes forward. You know. Yes. And 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 here's here's what you and I both know, and we know it from our hardcore religious experience. And we know it from being, uh, from having a public life for so many years. So much of this is simply personality driven. There are personality types who will never, ever, ever be able to swallow the idea of this type of, of secular community. And that's okay. You know, I mean, that's that's just that's the reality of it. And the idea that you have to position yourself in some way as to try to convince them that what you're doing for a totally different personality type really is OK and that they should give you their seal of approval is quite honestly a waste of time. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, it really is. It, it you know, the old saying that, you know, you can't please everyone is exactly right. So what I what I am trying and 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 I'm using a lot of Matt's wisdom in trying to do this is what I am trying to say is is that the need has always been there. The need will always be there and it will only become more obvious as more people in the south are able to step out and 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 you know confess <laughs> that they've realized they are atheists. Um and all we're trying to do is meet that one particular need for that one particular personality type. And for everyone else who is not comfortable with that, then please continue to do and support what you are comfortable with. How are we doing atheism-wise in the South? Or is I mean, they're there, but they're flying under the radar, or they simply need a wake-up call, or is everybody going to church? How uphill a climb is this? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's really strange. The first thing that comes to my mind to address that question is, it is an uphill climb, and one of the reasons that it is, is because in the South, there is this... this strange form of of hospitality of of a feigned tolerance that allows the religious community to completely ignore anything that may be in opposition to it you know uh, our story was told not once but twice in the new york times before I was approached by my local newspaper hmm. twice, you know, a book out on the bookshelves in the New York Times twice, not to mention all the other coverage before the local newspaper felt forced to address the issue, you know, and and I, I think that's just part of the Southern, um, you know, the Southern, I, I don't yeah, even, It may just be a religious. I mean, it may just be a, just blink away anything that makes you uncomfortable, which certainly yes. isn't limited to the South, you know. Well, that's probably true. Yeah. That that's probably that's probably very true. What what I know is is that an hour south of me, where we have founded, you know, Community Mission Chapel, um, we have a free thought group that exists primarily on Facebook. There are meetups monthly that has several hundred people in it, um, and. We know that we've probably got between 50 and 80 folks that are already committed to the chapel. This is in this is in a community of a couple of hundred thousands, you know, not not in a city of a million. So we're definitely here. We're definitely very, very strong. We're definitely getting our act together. We're already involved in charitable actions. There's a group that uh, our chapel will support called simply Because We Should that is already engaged in uh, charitable activities and, and does their best to try to be engaged in interfaith charitable activities. So so it, it's growing. It is very much a reality. The secular movement definitely has a voice and a place in the South. I had to uh, compliment you. I saw you on Morning Joe. Um, Thank you. I, I have a problem with the, the sheer number of journalists 
who aren't content to ask you about your exit from the faith, but they must interject in their question their own declaration of faith. Yes. And Joe is no different. You know, he'll say something like, you know, and I know that you walked away from Jesus. Now, I believe that there is a Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you say there's hope, but we know there's no hope for yeah, people. Yeah, it just seems so platform-ish. And considering the fact they went to all the trouble to bring you on, yeah, right. I, they didn't spend a whole lot of time with you. I'm shouting at the television. I mean, how's yes. the media overall been with you? Um television media pretty much like that <laughs> you know, i don't know if you've had a chance to see the cnn piece from last weekend um but um you know it was it was it was kind of the same you know uh i'd been asked to come on and talk about atheist church and 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 apparently that was that was the um you know what the segment was was designed to be about because all the lead in and all the b-roll and everything you know is is about that but then the questions from the anchors was really more about you know prove there's no god you know you know prove you're an atheist you know kind of things and 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 what you will really enjoy because i know this is the world that you live in right before i was to go on the air live in my earpiece, Spanish radio began to play. <laughs> Not just one station, but like two or three stations all, you know, uh, fighting over the same frequency. Wow. And I could barely hear the anchor's voice over the radio playing in the background. And so I, I honestly was a complete and total nervous wreck. I was about to just jump up and run out <laughs> of the studio. And, you know, and so then the guy, you know, starts, you know, well, it sounds more like you're agnostic than atheist, you know, and yeah. I'm thinking, what does that even matter? Yeah. Why, why would you care? You know? <laughs> well, I hear a lot of like the Fox News type of things. Like, wh why would you try to take away someone's faith? It, it's those yeah. very sort of. <laughs> And, and right. it's not like they're bringing you on to give your perspective, to add some color to the discussion. They're bringing right. you on to give them an excuse to defend God, which yes. isn't really the role, in my opinion, of a reporter. Um, yeah. Doesn't seem very journalistic. It's it's frustrating. I You know, I find myself, I, what, I torture myself and I'll watch Silverman go on the Hannity show. Right. And it's the same thing. You know, I'm yeah. like, this is this is church. This is the church of Hannity. And yes, he's not interested in really listening to Dave Silverman. He's he's wanting to use Silverman as his own platform to to preach Jesus. And it's exactly. frustrating. So it is. It, it is. And, you know, and Silverman's a great example of how, you know, because he's so masterful at handling the situation, um, you know, he's had he's he's had his opponents on live, you know, on television, say some really silly things, yeah. you know, just just almost forced them to say silly things that we're able to, you know, now I'll sit back and enjoy. But you don't ever want to make a mistake in the era of the Internet. Now, this gives me pause too, Jerry. You realize you and I, if we're ever out there and something horrible happens to us, yes. we will be immortalized forever yes. on the Internet. It's very sobering. You know, yeah, are you sure that hasn't already happened? I'm not. I, I don't even want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> no, you, you're exactly right, and that that plays back into, you know, my my caution of getting too far uh, away from my stump speech. Yeah, you know, and and so. I, I both love – well, no, I, I really do love the question and answer session. You know, I, I, remember, I remember hearing Dan Barker tell his story about his first debate that he got into, and he just fell in love with it and knew that's what he wanted to do. Well, for me, my first question and answer session was whenever I, I found out there was something just as fun as preaching. You know, and, yeah. and so I intentionally – if I've got an hour – to, to have the floor, I will intentionally try to get the preaching over with in 15 minutes so I can spend 45 <laughs> answering questions. But at the same time, yeah. you're really out there. I mean, you're, you're, you're walking without a net because, uh, you know, you, and I know you experienced this, you know, suddenly you'll look and somebody's got, you know, their iPhone up in the air and they're videoing it. And, you know, you're, you're one, 
you know, F word away from that being on the internet forever. You know, or so. or it's someone's, or it's a setup, right? Somebody's got a loaded question, or you know, they're just wanting to get that moment of discomfort out of you. I mean, that's just part of the debate arena. Quite frankly, though, I've I've I find real satisfaction going out there and doing what I'm passionate about. And I, I mean, I can see it on your face, Jerry. Despite all the challenges, oh, you seem absolutely. like a guy who's who's just you got a lot of good stuff. Madly in love with life, absolutely madly in love with life, and 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 looking forward without any reservation, looking forward to what I still have to learn, what I still have to experience, who I'm going to meet next. I am I'm 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 crazy about the idea of what life holds. I, I really am, and and. Maybe that's part of the question, you know, the love of the question and answer session because it's an adventure. You don't know what's next. And you and I, we, I think we protect ourselves a little bit because uh, one of the things that people love about you is, is that you're humble. And so when you walk up to the podium and everyone already knows that you're not claiming to know everything, mm-hmm. it's a little bit harder for them to set you up. And, and I relate that back to life. I no longer feel set up by life. I no longer feel set up for failure. I no longer feel like there's this huge divine weight of expectation upon me. And I'm every day learning how to love myself better, which means if you just stick around me long enough, if you stay my neighbor, whether you're a believer or a non-believer, if you stay my neighbor, if I learn to love myself better, then I'm going to love you better in the days and weeks and years to come. Jerry DeWitt, the author of Hope After Faith, an ex-pastor's journey from belief to atheism. You can find it on Amazon. It's at Barnes & Noble. Uh, IndieBound has it. Books a million. Did I miss anything? Any other place people can find it, Jerry? I, you know, there's a lot of independent stores, so, so don't hesitate to look at your favorite place. Yeah. Support this man. Support his story. To support, support what he's doing to help, I don't know, just stir the pot out there. And because he has such a love for people, he's an easy guy for me to root for. You're welcome back on this show anytime, Jerry. You're Thank welcome you. anytime. <laughs> Thank you. JerryDeWitt.net. Sign up for the newsletter, and I'll do my best to keep you up to date on what's next. We'll talk again soon. Thank you so much for spending the show with us. We appreciate it. Love you, brother. Thank you. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com.